welcome everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you to Everyone's Human Rights, uh, a series of debates on human rights uh, organized uh, by the Chair of African Legal Studies here uh, in cooperation with the um, uh, African uh, Cluster of Excellence at Bayreuth. Um, it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to the third event uh, in this series. Um, uh, and we are going to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Melina Kafelis, who will be talking to us um, about uh, violence, uh, human rights, and security in the post colonial state. My name is Toko Kaime. I'm uh, professor and chairholder for African Legal Studies uh, here at uh, Bayreuth. Um, before we start, I would like to uh, share a few housekeeping uh, notes with you. Um, I would like to request if you could please keep your uh, microphones uh, off uh, as uh, our presenter addresses us and if also possible uh, if uh, we could keep uh, the use of video to a minimum, uh, because we have uh, visitors joining us uh, from places where uh, uh, the bandwidth is not so reliable. So thanks for that. Uh, Melina is going to present for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we are going to have a series of questions uh, from the floor. Um, I would like to ask that you type uh, your name in the chat if you'd like to ask your question and perhaps the general outlines of the question. Then I'm going to invite you uh, to uh, speak to your questions. I'm going to take a series of questions, maybe three to four questions and then uh, allow uh, Melina to address them uh, together. All right, uh, with these few remarks, I would like to uh, invite uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Lina, to welcome our guest this evening. Thank you. I would also like to warmly welcome you and briefly introduce our today's guest speaker, Dr. Melina Kalfilis. She's a postdoc in social and political anthropology. Currently, she conducts research on vigilantism, transnational intervention, and violence in West Africa. Lately, she has been working as a research fellow at a cluster of excellence, Africa Multiple in Bayreuth, at the GIGAT German Institute of Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, and the Marian Institute for Advanced Studies in Africa at the University of Lagan in Ghana. Her research interests include, amongst others, politics, labor, transnationalism, civil society, violence, and ethics, as well as philosophical and global anthropology. Besides, she's working as a photographer and filmmaker. In February 2019, her third documentary film, NGO Crossroads, had its premiere at Fisbaco Festival in Ouagadougou. It deals with power norms and bureaucracy in NGO partnerships and the resilience of grassroots organizations in Burkina Faso. Now she's going to share some insights and reflections on violence, human rights and security in the post-colonial state in Africa. I would like to hand over to you, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lena. I will just uh, share my presentation. Just give me one second, please. Okay. Is it, um, I hope everyone can hear me and see the presentation. Uh, yes, okay, great. <clears throat> So, yes, thank you, first of all, again, so much for the invitation to this highly interesting event. I was very de delighted to be invited to present in this series and feel very honored to contribute to the discussions um, at the chair at the University of Bayreuth. Um, as Lena al already stressed, um, I am not in legal studies. I'm a social anthropologist with a more or less interdisciplinary profile. Consequently, my approach to study human rights related issues is based on field work, um, in this case in Burkina Faso, and provides very qualitative empirical material. The thoughts I will raise today and the analytical ideas I have 
are very new and based on very fresh material from the field in Burkina Faso. So I would be very delighted to have your questions and comments as this will help me to further develop the project I'm working on. Even though I am by discipline a social anthropologist, I do not plan to give a cultural relativist critique of human rights in this presentation. As a matter of fact, like Professor Kapindu last week, I would criticize authors like Jack Donnelly, who claim that human rights are foreign to pre-colonial Africa. From my point of view, even though the articles in the Human Rights Declaration are unquestionably far away from the social and political realities some people live in in Africa, a point I will return to later, I believe that some profound ideas inherited in these articles can be of universal value. Even though I believe that humans live, act, think and evaluate very differently, I would also agree with the philosophical anthropologist Michael Jackson that, and here I quote, there is probably no society on earth whose worldview is so insular that it does not contain at least the germ of the notion of a universal humanity. Despite differences based on language, heritage and interests, there exists the potentiality for strangers to be accommodated, for enmities to be overcome and cultural bar barriers to be transcended. Jackson uses a phenomenolo phenomenological approach just as the philosopher, philosopher Robert Berners-Cohn, who also wrote on human rights. He highlights that phenomenology gives us the opportunity to think human rights as a relation between humans and what this relation demands. While I find this perspective helpful on the one hand, on the other, other hand, I think that phenomenology is too ahistorical and depoliticized. It does not do justice to the historical and social realities we live in, or in Venada's words, to the different cosmologies of power and powerlessness. In the following, I will give a brief introduction to the political situation in Burkina Faso, present the actors I am working with, as well as my methodology. My, an my analysis then is divided into two parts. I will, um, in the first part, I will, I will give a new conceptual framework to describe vigilantism in Africa. In the second part, I will present two arguments. The first is about the blindness of human rights discourse towards everyday violence in the post-colonial state. And the second is of the, on the usefulness to differentiate between hidden and undisguised human rights violations. So I will start with the political context. After the popular struggle against the former president Blaise Compaoré in 2014, Burkina Faso has become the new epicenter in the conflict zone of the Sahel region. In the north and east of the country, violence is exacerbating. Not only do jihadist groups exploit rural communities' frustrations and fuel community-based violence, in the name of the fight against terrorism, state security forces, self-defense groups, and the military commit more and more atrocities against the population and discriminate certain ethnic groups like the Peu. All these just men mentioned actors, those who spread terror and contest the state, as well as those acting in the name of the state, hence contribute to a climate of distrust, retaliation, and hatred. In 2019, Burkina Faso suffered more militant, militant attacks than any other Sahelian country. This has fostered a bigger humanitarian crisis with almost a million people displaced only in Burkina Faso. The history of the self-defense groups called Kogoyogo, which means something like protectors of the territory, not of the bush as it's sometimes translated, goes back to the 1970s, but, but the groups only mushroomed in 2016. Today, thousands of groups exist nationwide. Their main agenda is to fight against thievery, banditry, and petty crime. However, observations show that the groups also deal with other security-related issues, like death threats, drug abuse, corruption, 
and extremist motivated violence. Although the groups show commonalities, it remains very difficult to make general statements about the individual groups as they proceed very differently from region to region. While media and policy papers disseminate a lot of assumptions about the Koguyogos, let me stress here that the Koguyogos cannot be understood as a homogeneous entity. An important commonality is that most units have their own prisons. Above that, most groups carry out informal proceedings, court proceedings, but I prefer to call them public pro conflict processes. During these processes, the Kogoriogos gather alleged victims, accusing persons, witnesses and relatives to negotiate the guilt of the accused and his or her punishment. These punishments can include fines and shaming, but also public whiplashes and other forms of physical abuse, which is why the Kogoriogos are repeatedly um, accused of violating international human rights. Especially in the North and in the East, where terrorist activities contribute to a climate of distrust, the Kogoriogos complicate the situation. They have been involved in intercommunal conflicts and latest, point, uh, latest events point to the conclusion that communities divide into opponents and um, uh, supporters of the groups. Such developments exacerbate the declining security situation in the region and polarize ethnic conflicts in the country, which has long been idealized as a positive example for inter-ethnic and inter-religious peace. Until today, there is no public consensus on the Koguyogos in the political arena of Burkina Faso. While the physical punishments are publicly condemned, many citizens nevertheless praise the deterrence effect of the groups. In 2016, the government tried to institutionalize the Kogoyogos as a neighborhood police force, but this was rejected by the national representatives of the groups. However, while their autonomy from the state today is not as evident as it used to be, it is important to stress that the groups cooperate with state security forces in the different regions to, to varying degrees, I would say, and they do, that they do not contest the state. Beyond that, most groups are today registered as associations with municipalities and have thus gained a formal status as civil society organizations in Burkina Faso. The Koguyogos have hence established a feared but at the same time, legitimate political institution in Burkina Faso with 64 groups registered, registered alone in the capital of Ouagadougou. This also leads me to a brief description of my methodology and field. I conduct research in Burkina Faso since 2009. My dissertation focuses on NGO partnerships, the life worlds of NGO actors in Burkina Faso, as well as the terms for poverty in the language of Moray. Since 2018, I conduct partic participant observation with two Koguyogu units in Ouagadougou, which you can see um, on the map. Additionally, my research partner, Dr. Amado Kabore and I realized open-ended and group interviews with, Kogu with a Koguyogu unit in Zorgo, the which is a provincial capital in Burkina Faso in the the city where I conducted my research with NGOs. It is important to me to mention that throughout this presentation, although every time when I refer to the Kogoyogos, I refer to these three groups because as I said before, the groups um, are very different and uh, it's very difficult to make general statements about them. As you can imagine, conducting fieldwork with self-defense groups who imprison people and also punish them by their own means is quite a challenging uh, fieldwork for me. While my focus in this talk is a different one, let me just briefly stress that I put a strong emphasis on ethics in my research. Until now, I have developed some conceptual starting points to enable a more systematic reflection about my own position in the field and the challenge to conduct research um, in places where violence can occur.
As already indicated, I divided my analysis into two parts, which built upon each other. The first part looks more closely at the Kogo Weogos, their emergence in 2016, and the way I conceptually grabbed the phenomenon of vigilantism in Burkina Faso. Then, in the second part, I will take a closer look at the articles in the Human Rights Declaration and carve out certain, a certain blindness towards some articles violated within the orders of the post-colonial state. Finally, I will conceptually divide hidden from undisguised human rights violations and reflect about dignity in my field. During more than 12 months of participant observation in Burkina Faso, I have always put a strong focus on the question how people navigate through life in the face of, un in the face of uncertainty, lack of perspective and stability. Maybe this is the reason why it appeared too superficial and short-sighted to me that the social science interpret vigilantism singularly in relation to the politics of the post-colonial state. To me, the Kogoyogos are more the Janos phase of an everyday life pervaded by crime, structural violence and impunity, an everyday life in which for generations no one has sought a balance in conflict situations and in which social misconduct and breaches of law take place without any consequence. Throughout the years, stories about stolen cattle, burglary, robberies, and the police's inability to drag down those responsible were a big deal in my field and in my social surrounding in Burkina Faso. And even if the police had caught somebody, I was told that they would let the accused walk free a couple of hours or months later, uh, days later, not months. Furthermore, there are a lot of people who do not have access to political and legal institutions in Burkina Faso at all. Those men and women who, tr who live truly marginalized do not even arrive at making a complaint at the police station. Above that, until now, I am desperately searching for a place in Ouagadougou where people would find legal advice if needed. This is the state-centered dimension that explains the emergence of the Kogoweogos. However, there is another dimension to it, one that I came across during my fieldwork with the Kogoweogos themselves. During conversations, the groups rarely refer to the state, but pointed to a moral decay and a growing distrust in communities. After I had participated in several conflict processes of the Kogoweogo, this explanation made much more sense to me. As it turned out, a lot of criminal activity takes place between relatives, neighbors, and friends. Sons stealing from their fathers, nephews betraying their aunt, and friends taking advantage of the other's trust. These are only some examples which illustrated why the Kogoweogos spoke of a moral decay. I then realized that the Kogoweogos were not only some kind of substitutes to the state, they have opened a space in which citizens are able to voice abuses and lay open conflicts, sometimes for the first time in their life. However, this does neither mean that all decisions by the Kogoweogos are rightful, nor an, undis un an undisputed source of justice. While I would state that the conflict processes show the potential of contributing to a more peaceful cohabitation in communities, they, at, they are at the same time hardening conflicts and contribute to a climate of denunciation. Also from an outsider's point of view, the fact that a group of men take the law into their own hands and punish people is highly disturbing. However, my claim is that it is impossible to make a black or white judgment about the question whether the Kogoweogos are good or a bad thing. As Ray Abrahams already wrote in 1998, vigilantism is a political paradox as these actors break with law in order to enforce it. This also mirrors in the quote of a schoolgirl in Bagadugu, which I also used for the title of this presentation. They are frightening, but I can sleep at night. It is against this background that we cannot easily make a judgment about the Kogoweogos. Unquestionably, they move in a moral twilight zone. While it is impossible to judge, 
I argue that we can only appropriately frame vigilantism if we take the experiences of people seriously who suffer from cr crime, impunity, exclusion, insult, extortion, and corruption. These phenomena demarcate a plurality of everyday forms of violence that are difficult to imagine in a privileged, in a privileged position like I am. Nevertheless, my research with NGOs sensitized me for the life worlds of the most vulnerable part of the population in Burkina Faso. And this might be the reason why I understood the appearance of the Kogu Weogos as an interruption and at the same time reproduction of the structural violence I just described. Against this background, for quite some time, I searched for a proper way to describe the Kogu Weogos activities a pathway as neutral as possible, one that neither idealizes nor demonizes the Kogoyogos. This is how I ended up conceptualizing vigilantism as a political process in which continuities of everyday violence express, shift, transform, and reproduce. The Kogoyogos change the allocation of violence in the everyday of people in Burkina Faso. This means that they change ways in which violence is distributed to and against whom it is directed, under what conditions and by what means it is used, as well as where, when, and by whom it occurs, and finally, where the limits of violence lie. I find this conceptual framework helpful for two reasons. The first is that the thesis describes the effects of the self-defense groups in a value neutral way and opens new analytical avenues on violence. Within this thesis lies secondly the assumption that violence, no matter if structural, institutional, physical or symbolic, has always been an integral part of the everyday of people in Burkina Faso. But why is this thesis important when it comes to international human rights? Let me enter this question with a small story from the field. On the 13th of March, 2020, shortly before Corona forced me to leave West Africa in a hurry, me and my research colleague and partner, Dr. Amado Kabore, were sitting in the garden of my hotel in Ouagadougou. We discussed ethical issues of our research and the concrete action steps we could take to ensure our security. We also spoke about how human rights discourse and a new report of the International Crisis Group um, appeared in which they framed the Kogoyogos as Lords of the Bush. We were very critical about this name as it reminds of the term warlord. Through the course of this conversation, I realized that I had not looked closely enough at the articles in the Human Rights Declaration. I hence downloaded the document, looked carefully at each article, and I felt quite irritated ever since. Mainly because I counted more human rights violations committed by the state than by the Kogoyogos. Violations the state had committed long before terrorism and self-defense groups had entered the political arena in Burkina Faso. I summarized some of the article. For example, Article 6, everyone has the right to rec recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Or Article number eight, 8, everyone has the right to an effective remedy by the competent national tribunals for acts violating the fundamental rights granted him by the constitution or by law. Or Article 17, 2, no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. Or Article number 21, everyone has the right to equal access to public service in his country. While reports piling up on the human rights violations committed by the Kogoyogos, little attention is paid to the daily atrocities, especially those committed by the Bukinavi government. During the preparation of this presentation, I then checked the archive of the Human Rights um, Watch website and look for reports on Burkina Faso and human rights. I only found two, one from 2018 and one from 2019. Due to my research in the development world, I am very aware of the political economy behind the advocacy and strategies of international organizations. But this is not the point I want to make today. 
My thesis is, is a different one. Human rights discourse is turning a blind eye towards structurally embedded human rights violations, those deeply rooted in the institutions of the post-colonial state. Put differently, to use again Nancy Shepard Hughes and Philippe Bourgeois, it is, everyday um, it is everyday violence towards which, towards which human rights discourse is blind. I made two observations in this regard. Firstly, these blind spots illustrate how, since decolonization, the international community has tended to ignore the large gap between the formal status of African political systems and the realpolitik that is happening on the ground. Secondly, blind spots indicate that the articles in the Human Rights Declaration are not of equal value. By the violations of Article Number 5, for example, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, raise a lot of international attention. There is silence about the deprivation people experience when in contact with the post-colonial state orders. Of course, I do not want to imply that everyday violence is equal to murder, torture or systematic killing. But in regards to the phenomenon of vigilantism, I think we need to pay more attention to everyday forms of violence and the traces it leaves in the life worlds of people. This is why I highlighted vigilantism in Burkina Faso as a political process that changes the way, the way structural violence unfolds in the everyday of people. Put differently, in order to understand why people in Burkina Faso fear, but at the same time wish for the Koguyogos to install in communities, it is important to take note of the silent violations of dignity and citizens' rights in Burkina Faso. Dignity leads me to another idea. In order to take everyday violations of human rights by the state more serious, a conceptual differentiation between hidden and undisguised human rights violations might be useful. First and foremost, this idea builds on the fact that human rights violations also take place in prisons and, sta prisons and state security institutions, but usually they are happening in secret. While the Koguyogo's conflict processes take place in the middle of the district, publicly accessible with unhidden proceedings, nobody can monitor how and why state officials violate people in custody. This is why I find the analytical difference between hidden and undisguised human rights violations quite useful. The transparency of the Koguyogo's proceedings ensures the legitimacy of their institution as they allow the community to exert a certain social control over them, a control they have never had over state institutions. Hence, while both institutions violate the dignity of people, the differentiation between hidden and undisguised violation draws a line where questions about political responsibility and legitimacy arise. Being more transparent, by being more transparent, the Koguyogos hazard the consequences of their actions, like international criticism or the regular scapegoating of the groups in the international, national and local media. Hence, they also take re political responsibility for the violence they use, a kind of responsibility the state rarely takes for his actions. Political responsibility also gives orientation when it comes to the question of dignity. Future, um, and the future of those who are target of punitive measures. The Koguyogos reintegration program for young drug addicts is a good example in this regard. On the 8th of March, 2020, the Koguyogo president in Goudrin told me that they, had a young, that they had young drug addicts in custody. He brought the young men over. Six of them were in shackles, one wasn't. It was him who spoke the best French and explained the program to me. He said that the Koguyogos do not allow the young men to leave them before their patterns of behavior have changed. After some time, if they behave well, they are allowed to find work at daytime and save the money they earn in the Koguyogo's cash register. As soon as they have saved some money, they can leave. 
So I asked the boy why he did not leave, as he was obviously free to go because he didn't wear any shackles. He, re he replied that he, had that he had decided to stay with the Koguryogos. If he would go back, he said, to his friends and to his district, he would start using drugs again. At the end of our conversation, I also asked the young men who they feared more, the Koguryogos or the police. They said they were afraid of both, but would prefer to be caught by the Koguryogos, as the beatings of the police were much worse and they would give them only very little food and water in comparison to the Koguryogos. I heard a lot about the dehumanizing circumstances in state prisons and police stations in Burkina Faso, especially for those people who do not have any relatives who bring them food and care for them. Above that, state reintegration measures are almost non-existent in Burkina Faso. Those who leave the prison after months or years stand almost no chance to gain a foothold in society. They start off at the most marginalized position one can imagine. I think that this last um, story opens a lot of interesting perspectives. To me, in relation to international human rights, it even raises the question of who's actually respecting the dignity of people more, the state or the Kogoboyogos. But this is actually another story. I will come to the conclusion. My main, int main intention in this talk was to offer a perspective on human rights that takes the cosmologies of the powerless as a starting point and to offer a more nuanced perspective on the, on the um, activities of the Kogoweogos. Of course, there is power abuse, corruption and injustice taking place at the center of the Kogoweogos and I do not want to deny that. They have become very powerful political actors and only the future can show if and which groups will manage to become truly legitimate and also sustainable institutions in the political landscape of Burkina Faso. I have a lot of bad, but also a lot of good stories to tell about them. And there are also a lot of things to learn and to understand about those actors in Africa who take the law into their own hands. And I hope that I was able to show that. Debates on human rights often seem to raise questions about the uni universality of its claims or our responsibility to intervene in advocate. My approach is, as I was hoping to show, a totally different one. I use the concept of everyday violence to show that human rights policy does not treat the articles in the declaration with equal value. I also questioned the human rights discourse sweeping condemnation of violent non-state actors and its blindness towards the silent everyday violations of human rights by the post-colonial state. And finally, I argued for new conceptual avenues like an analytical differentiation between hidden and undisguised human rights violations. This not only opens questions about who takes political responsibility for his or her actions, but also about the carrying pillars of the normative global order we live in. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, many, many thanks for uh, a very interesting uh, presentation. And um, we are now going to uh, have um, a series of questions from uh, the floor. I see already in the chat that uh, a number of people have indicated that they would like to uh, ask um, uh, a question and have a discussion with you. I'll, I'll go first since I'm uh, your host uh, this evening. And my question uh, relates to uh, your perspectives about uh, the role of state law uh, especially human rights law in contexts like these where state violence has been, uh, for lack of a better word, democratized, uh, what should be the state, uh, the role of state law and human rights law? Uh, I see here that uh, Tanu uh, and Andrea uh, would like to ask questions. So I'll ask uh, Tanu first, and then we'll take a question from uh, Andrea. Okay. 
Tanu, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you, uh, Melina. Was, nice to meet uh, you too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, firstly, uh, I, I congratulate you on your courage, both as a scholar and a person for choosing uh, this subject uh, and doing ethnographic work, you know, on this. So um, uh, I, I really appreciate this. I had uh, two questions. Uh, one regarding, because you started with uh, a critique, uh, you know, you criticized phenomenology uh, for being uh, possibly ahistorical in the context of your work. So I was uh, wondering, and I just let you know that I, I'm on the, I'm going to defend phenomenology here. Okay, so uh, uh, the, the question is why, I mean, which school of phenomenology are you particularly referring to when you, um, when you say this, because I, I would uh, disagree uh, that phenomenology uh, can be a historical. Um. And my second uh, one is about the, you know, the role of the child in giving you a different perspective as, a, as an anthropologist in the field, because you, you use this quote where she says, uh, you know, yeah, it's scary, but I can still sleep at night. And it seems from what you narrated that this uh, the insight, you know, that there is a nuance there uh, came from the child expressing that she feels secure in a context of insecurity. And since you uh, say you're committed to reflecting on your role and, you know, uh, position, your position, I wonder, as an adult anthropologist, if you explicitly have reflected and acknowledged the role of the child participant in giving you a different perspective, you know, in your analytical phase. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, I will try to answer briefly um, or not too long. Actually, I didn't mean to criticize phenomenology per se because I use this approach a lot. Uh, I refer to the fact that phenomenology is interested in the, in the very subjective perspective and the way sub, sub, um, people create together a shared life world. And in this perspective, sometimes the historical and the political perspective gets lost because the focus is a different one. And this is why I tend to um, integrate other approaches to bring in the, the historical and the political perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think this was a misunderstanding because I'm a great fan of and um, phenomenology, especially that of um, Michael Jackson, for example. Mm -hmm. um, about the quote and the the child, I'm, she wasn't, yeah, I mean, actually, I don't know how old she was, but she wasn't that young um, anymore. Generally, she didn't say um, um, they are frightening, but I can still sleep at night. She said they are frightening, but we can uh, sleep peacefully at night. I shortened it a little bit mm -hmm. because the because it's in the title. So um, she referred to this fact that on the one hand, they, the people in the community are afraid of the punishments of the Koguyogo and what they do, and this arbitrariness connected to their actions. And on the other hand, because they have really a, an amazing effect on the crime rates in communities, they can sleep much more peaceful now because there are not robberies, thievery, etc., going on every night, which was really a, a, a large issue um, in, uh, in Burkina Faso before. And um, I didn't actually reflect about the fact that she um, is still going to school. Um, but uh, for me, it was kind of um, confirming my impression that it is not only me who has difficulties to say whether the, it's a good or a bad thing, but that it's also in the community that people have ver are very uh, torn between um, between the question to f if they think it's a good or a bad thing. Of course, there are also many people who would say it's, it's, it's dangerous, it, it can't be, it's violating all our um, ideas of the state and our, in the orders we want to live in. And there are those who would say, no, it's a good thing. Finally, um, somebody is doing something about the situation we have. But there are many people, I think, who are torn because they see that there are also positive effects. But at the same time, of course, there is this, um, unease with the idea that there are these men who go around and catch people and 
of course also can not judge really if somebody is telling the truth or not so there are also very a lot of problems connected to this i hope this um Answers. Yeah, I, the reason I would, because I, I refer to, chi when I say child, I mean below 18 as well, like uh, the legal uh, definition. And it's just that my critique of uh, anthropology uh, has also been that, you know, anthropologists, and I, I myself use anthropological, uh, you know, uh, methods, but often the role of the, you know, there are children, you know, in the field, and we write and talk as if it's all about like adult life worlds. And then there are moments mm -hmm. where where the children point something out or show you something and this mm -hmm. ne is never explicitly that's mentioned. true thank you so much this for is a this reflection comment. I know, it's very you it's to, uh, totally and actually just yeah. one brief uh, thing about this because actually education and child education is very imp important in the context of the kogo Wayogos. um it's 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 um, well, it irritated me in the beginning, but when they physically punish somebody and if there are these kind of public processes, the people tend to send over the children to watch because they want to see them what is happening if they don't behave well. This is something I think in, in our society, people would, would take their children away and tell them not to look and there it's the opposite. So it, it has this very educative dimension and this is an aspect that my colleague, who I also mentioned in the talk, is working um, very uh, intensively about. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I'd love to continue the conversation. But yeah, I, I will, I'm sure. On to, yeah, <laughs> I it, yeah, Toko, thank you. I Thanks. To you. Okay, uh, Melina, um, I did ask a question, but maybe it's, I mean, some time has elapsed. I can oh. pick it up again later. Uh, do you want to address it I'm, or? Uh, no, I'm so sorry. Could you, could you please repeat the okay. question? Okay, all right. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to it uh, later on. Let me invite uh, others uh, to ask you a couple of questions. I'm, I'm so going sorry. to invite uh, Andrea uh, to ask you a question and then uh, that will be uh, followed uh, by uh, Dr. Probert. Um, okay, please, Andre. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Melina, for a really fantastic and exciting and also, for me, very new information that you gave, a very good presentation. Thank you, Toko, for organizing this. Um, I'm really excited to see so many people here. Okay, I will ask my question briefly. So, I already mentioned it in the, in the chat. You were... Uh, your material reminded me of, of two works actually. One is by Janet Reutemann on the transborder smuggling and the ethics of illegality that she talks about in the Chad Basin, where she also talks about how um, transborder smugglers legitimize their work by on the one hand saying, well, we don't have any other work and this is what we do for a living. And on the other, um, being involved with high state officials who are actually coming with their big car and opening the trunk to get in the, you know, the, the gain that they have. So this is the one thing, the ethics of illegality that you also seem to observe. And on the other hand, uh, Julia Eckert's work on India on the Shiv Sena right-wing radical party who uses, that uses um, direct action, violent direct action in poor, mainly poor neighborhoods to recruit people. And that's um, because I, this is a very powerful way of uh, determining power, right? So I wondered, now you seem to have groups who tell you about their moral ethics, you know, bringing people back into the community, doing things that the state doesn't do, but that is exactly the same rhetoric that this, um, violent right-wing party has in India, which is so extremely successful. And I wondered, so on the one hand, what happens between these groups if there are so many, aren't there power struggles over areas, over influence, over who is right and wrong, and can't people go to one group if um, the, well, if the punishment they, they expected is not given, so they go to another? And won't that, do you think, um, lead maybe to some larger form of, of power that would then become possibly dangerous. So these are just some questions I wanted to ask you, but thank you very much. Very exciting, beautiful presentation. 
Thank you so okay. much. And, uh, yes. Dr. Probe or Probat, I am. Right, I, I put my name Thomas in the in, in the chat. My Zoom account is more interested in my my. Title. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay. okay. Can't Please change it. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, uh, it was a question about uh, it, I, I said about pardon or forgiveness, um, which which could sound a bit like the cliched question about traditional or informal justice mechanisms in Africa. But I, I just thought that there was a um, a potential uh, irony or relationship between the accountability process uh, in of those hidden violations that you that you counterposed um you know the, the the formal human rights conversation in Burkina Faso at the moment is totally about um this this accountability for a small group of individuals um for such hidden violations that were then overcome with this very performative um day of forgiveness uh, and, and so the, the, the rationale of some kind of um, indigenous uh, um, preference for forgiveness has been co-opted in the formal sector. And I wondered whether in actually the informal sector it existed or, or not, because you, you, you didn't mention it. I just wondered whether there, there was such a, an element of, of pardon or, or forgiveness that um, maybe doesn't exist in the formal sector. Just a short question by the formal, you mean then which you mean the, the state or? Yes, yes, exactly. So okay. the, 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 um, the thing I'm counterposing it to is the, the, the Zongo uh, accountability process and the day of forgiveness that was mm. that mm -hmm, taught mm -hmm. as a way of, of moving beyond that that now seems to be being overturned again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, should I should I answer? Um, yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, I start with um, Andrea uh, for also for the literature you mentioned. I will look that up for sure. And um, you raised a lot of many important uh, questions and a lot of topics I could not um, mention in this talk because I had a very narrow uh, focus, uh, but. Uh, at first, to be, to be clear, yes, uh, this is, of course, can be dangerous for the future. This is also something you can see in other uh, countries where vigilante groups um, appeared and um, they can play a significant role in civil wars, um, etc., etc. What is quite fascinating is that since five years, something like that did not happen. Um, I know that there are power struggles between the three national representatives of the groups who are in different regions in Burkina Faso. But at the same time, what is, I think I didn't mention as well is that all the groups are kind of organized in a topography. So if one group wants to install, they have to go to a group that is already registered as, a, as an association and they have to allow them to install themselves. So they are kind of change, chains uh, going down the whole authority of these groups. Um, and it also happened, for example, that in one incident in a, a conflict between in a community that uh, the one Koguyogo that was held accountable wasn't even there, but it was a Koguyogo from another city hundreds of kilometers away because he was kind of the head of this chain and he was responsible for them. And he was the one who was imprisoned by the state then for a couple of weeks. So um, where there is at the one hand this power struggle, on the other hand, it's quite, quite hierarchical and the orders are kind of clear also within the group. You have always a president, a vice president, uh, those who fill the role of the judges, although they, they don't call themselves anymore judges, but conseillers, uh, so consultants, one could say. And um, yes, about bringing people back to the community, um, I think it's maybe um, you are completely right um, about this mobilization power these groups have, but um, in most cases they don't take up new members. So the members are very, they don't want to have more and more people who become Koguyogo, although it's a very complicated issue, but there, if you go into a community, many people would say, I'm Koguyogo, I'm Koguyogo. But in truth, formally, 
there is a group and they don't um, take everyone into their group as they want because actually they don't have an ideological um, identity behind these groups but also this is conflictual it's it's so complex and complicated but um, yeah I hope that um, this gives you some kind of answers but of course I am worried for the future um, especially in the north of the region and in the Sahel where uh, the Koguyogos play a role nobody can really um, estimate I hope this is kind thank of you clear. very much and we will further discuss it exactly <laughs> Um, about the pardon and forgiveness, um, I'm not sure if I, I completely understood the question, but um, this idea of pardon and forgiveness plays, um, didn't play, I think, um, a very important role in the context of formal institutions. It did for sure play a role in the um, indigenous or um, in the cultural dimension of communities. But um, I think one aspect that also kind of sparked the development of the Kogo Wuyogos is that the so-called chiefs, so these traditional authorities that used to be the ones who were really there to, um, to reconcile, to, to help people get through conflicts and everything, they are said to be too much co-opted by the state and that they have kind of left this position or this role and the youth especially feels very much left behind by them. And then on the other hand, now in the Koguwiogos, you see that a lot of um, traditional uh, of chiefs are in part of the Koguwiogos and they often have this very important role as conseiller, uh, for example, because they bring the wisdom and the experience. And in this public processes, they do forgiveness and pardon plays a very important role and you have a lot of rituals um, like swearing on mother earth, eating a little bit of earth, um, pouring water into the sand and doing rituals with it. Um, they all belong um, to this kind of pardon um, that is happening. And what you can also see is that if somebody is a repeat offender two times or even three times, um, it gets, uh, they get, they treat the person much more rough. I was so unlucky to be there when they brought a young man who was caught for the third time in flagranti breaking into a house. And um, yeah, there's when I, how I saw how they treat these people in comparison to those they catch, for example, for the first time. So they get more rough, more brutal. The penalties get more intense, I would say. Yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm observing uh, the time and um, we don't have so much of it left and still a few more questions. So I would like uh, our uh, uh, next participants to be a bit brief. I'm going to invite uh, Isabel, uh, Hassan and Martin to ask their questions. Isabel, first uh, with your question. Thank you. Thank you, Melina. Um, I have one short question about status as observer. Mm -hmm. So the first part would be, um, do you think that you're, um, while you are observing actions or reactions have changed? So would situations have been different without you? Mm -hmm. um, that's the first part. And the second part is, um, whether you have ever interacted in, or um, yeah, have yeah, whether you have ever interacted into a situation, and when not, maybe a bit a provocative question: What is the sense of observing um, human rights violations when not doing anything against it? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think the first part of the question is a question anthropologist will be hunted by for the rest of their lives. Um, I am pretty sure it's, it's undeniable that my presence is influencing the situation. Um, I also have to say that I'm still in the process to gain trust of these groups. And this takes a lot of time, especially because of this human rights narrative that is hanging over them and it was also very difficult to get access to these groups because when they see me they first think I'm a journalist and I want to write about their human rights violations. Um, I interacted 
um, I don't know exactly what you mean, but I, um, at, well, at, at this point, I really put a focus on observation because I think qu asking questions is quite difficult and because every conversation about the Kogu Ryogos is kind of political. Um, and I, I don't feel that I'm really, really trusted by them until now. So, but I accompanied them on a mission, for example, for one time. And um, in situations where the, the human rights violations happen, I, happened, and this was only um, two times until now that I was present, um, I, I pulled myself uh, from the situation. And uh, it's, of course, a question that is also um, touching me, um, why I do not do something about it. And this is kind of why I also did this presentation to show that if you take it from the perspective of those who do not gain access to state law, um, the, the equilibrium of what is right and what is not right kind of changes. And if I take this position, I find some understanding why um, people want the Kogu Ryogos. And so I also try to treat it with this non-normative perspective when these violations happen. But this, of course, doesn't free me from a certain responsibility. And this is also why I reflect about it and I speak about it openly and, um, well, see where this journey is taking me, kind of. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Melina, for your wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you had indicated that uh, uh, these uh, vigilante groups have caught, uh, which you had uh, preferred, if I had understood you, uh, public uh, conflict uh, processes. And I think it is from here uh, where they impose now their punishment. So my question is, uh, from where do they derive uh, the authority to impose this punishment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you so much. Well, um, there are different theories about that. Uh, this is also why I mentioned that it's not exactly clear how autonomous the Koguyogos are from the state. From what I, I, re I was there when the, in the period when the Koguyogos appeared. And from my impression at the beginning, they gave this authority to themselves. Then uh, there were fights with the government, um, Koguyogos being arrested, Koguyogos protesting against the police because they arrested the Koguyogos, etc., etc. Then they tried to institutionalize the Koguyogos, um, what they didn't agree upon, but now they kind of informally being together. So I would say the authority does in some, to a certain degree, come from the state because they tolerate them. And they also grant them the, the right to be registered as um, civil society organizations within the state. Um, and also, I think that the Mogo Naba, which is the religious or traditional authority in Burkina Faso, is supporting the group, which also gives them authority. And then you also have to see it, I think, in a kind of as a local phenomenon or a community based phenomenon. So the people that are Kogo Wiogos are often people that people trust or think that they have a certain quality that makes it a good thing that they are in this group. Um, uh, yeah, so to be brief, uh, um, I hope this kind of answers. Uh, yeah, yeah, it answers, but uh, one more. So if they, let's say they want to impose a specific punishment, what would be the source? Or will it be a religious, uh, the fall back to their religion or from what is stipulated in the secular courts, what would be the source mm -hmm. for them to impose that particular punishment? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think as it is kind of typical for Burkina, it's a mix of um, traditional African religion um, sometimes, but also, um, so for example, when the Kogwiogos install in the community, the Catholic priest, the Imam and the traditional chief have to agree upon it. So I think depending on the group, they have different sources. I heard about a group who are very much relying on the Quran. Another thing that is kind of okay. worrying because they also mm -hmm. forbid some things, but this mm -hmm. is only one group I heard about. In the groups that I work with, um, there are Muslims, Christians, different ethnic uh, groups as well. And um, it's more the, the culture of the Mossi that expresses. But if you go to the East, for example, there are more of the ethnic group Gomanche. And I heard that the groups there are more relying on the Goma Manche culture. 
And at the same time, it is important, I think, to stress that they mix this with bureaucratic principles, which is kind of interesting because I think this also lends them a certain um, legitimacy. They, they have a book where they, where they put everything down. Um, they have very firm fees. So for a stolen egg in the beginning, you had to pay 15,000 CFA. For a so stolen chicken, you had to pay this. And until today, for example, in the group in Zorgo that I work with, they have this very fixed prices for everything they steal. So I think it's a very, it's a very interesting mix of sources they use for this kind of punishing and authority of punishing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, and then uh, we finish uh, with uh, Stephen. Uh, could uh, we take both questions uh, now, please? Okay, yeah, uh, most of my questions you answered to, to, to Hassan. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring presentation, also for the answers giving. My, my, my broader question was on the relationship between the state and the groups. Uh, and the more precise one is on phenomena which, which have a strong human rights aspects is, uh, on double punishment. So, we, we, uh, are there phenomena where both the state and the group is punishing and if there's uh, is are there practices um, to interrelate um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the procedures um, it's, it's a typical lawyers question but I think it's from a from a from a question for, for, for the uh, point of legitimation it's, it's it's very important if the, if, if the state would refrain from mm -hmm. from punishing themselves if the if the groups are punished mm -hmm. thank you we are collecting, right? And, yeah. and, and Stephen now, please. Oh, well, I think just, just a brief one. I really just wanted to understand whether, um, I think in the preliminary perhaps uh, research, whether the, the, the issue has generated interest or discussion, I think in the uh, mainstream human rights mechanism, for example, I think um, maybe through the special procedures reports or well, maybe through the uh, concluding perhaps uh, observations by treaty bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting questions, very important questions. Um, double punishment, I, I didn't uh, see that uh, until now, but uh, there is a lot of interaction between the groups that I work with and the government bodies. So, for example, if um, the police sends cases over to the Koguweogos, um, and also the Koguweogos sometimes say, okay, this is too, too much money we are talking about that was stolen, for example, you should go to the police. So they, they help each other. Or, for example, I mean, this is also an issue, uh, the state security apparatus in Burkina Faso is very weak, very underfinanced, money disappearing, no cars, no uh, people working, not enough people working, covering all this crime. So there was this one case that somebody stole a big truck and the police didn't have any motorbikes to follow the truck. So they went to the Kogo Wilbos and asked them if they could go catch up with this truck and they did. And so, yes, there is a lot of... Um, though informal um, collaboration between them. Um, and uh, the, about the issue about the, how the mainstream human rights discourse is reacting to the Kokuyogos, there are sometimes some more nuanced um, accounts, but there is still this very, there is still this tendency to frame them as lords of the bush and to point more to the issues of power abuse than to the productive things they do, which is of course also understandable. Interestingly, I met with several peace building organizations who have decided to work with the Kogu Weobos. And um, I think that in the future, the group's name might appear more in relation to the fight against terror as well. And um, especially also in the programs of peace building organizations, which kind of shows that there is this shift um, also due to maybe empirical data that is gathered about these groups and um, <coughs> yeah, <sorry. coughs> 
<clears throat> I'm <clears throat> done. <laughs> <clears throat> Did this answer your question or? Melina. Um, yes. Topo, I, yes. Yes, I think, I think, <clears throat> I think that uh, addresses the question somewhat. I mean, it's a, it's a lawyer's question. Please. Uh, in, in, in my view and, and, um, tries to establish a baseline for uh, what would be legal analysis but uh, your your research uh, uh, looks more at the uh, social and uh, community dynamics and so uh, perhaps uh, this is a baseline that uh, might not have been so useful uh, in the methodology that you you, you looked at uh, but I'm sure you know uh, that these are things that uh, others uh, working on human rights and looking at uh, state violence uh, and also uh, general uh, violence uh, uh, in Burkina uh, will have addressed to the relevant institutions, whether um, at the African Union level uh, or beyond. Uh, yes, so I, I would like to thank you for uh, very interesting uh, perspectives uh, uh, on uh, on this issue uh, and uh, for answering uh, a range, a broad range of questions in relation to this. And I'm going to bring um, uh, this discussion formally to a close, uh, but I would like to uh, ask you and anyone else who would like to talk a little bit more uh, to uh, hang around, then we can have a more informal chat uh, about uh, methodology, but also work that you are planning uh, to do building up uh, on the research that you have conducted so far. I see uh, amongst uh, our participants, I see uh, Christoph Haynes. Uh, Prof, I'm going to uh, ask you to say a few things, if that's okay, uh, in a couple in a couple minutes. So if you could. Uh, hang around uh, as well. Um, I would like to say thank you uh, and goodbye to everyone. Uh, uh, hang around if you wish, but uh, you may also uh, step off now. Thank, thank you, you so much again for listening and taking the time to everyone. <laughs>